of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty Your Son shows us the way of service, and in him we inherit the riches of your grace. 
Give us the wisdom to know what is right and the courage to do it. Give us the strength to serve the world that you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Ezekiel. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. 
as shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the watercourses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide, I will save my flock and they shall no longer be ravaged and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Word of God, word of life. A reading from Ephesians. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glory inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Word of God, word of life. Oh, come, 
Let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And the dry land, which his hands have formed. Come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel. According to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter, glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? When was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family. You did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You are accursed. Depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them. Truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is a perennial error of human beings that we take perfectly good gifts of God and we elevate them to the status of God and we worship them. So in our day, in our culture, we take a wonderful gift of God, personal freedom. But it becomes for us that which we honor and prize above 
all things. In some cases, that which we pin all our hope and all our happiness on. And nothing, nothing upsets us more than being told that we can't do something we want to do. Sometimes to express this modern view of freedom, we use words like autonomy, which means self-law. That is, to be autonomous is to become a law unto ourselves. There is no divine law, there is only the law I create for myself. Or we speak of personal sovereignty. Nobody is the king of me but me. Perhaps then on this Sunday of Christ the King, there is no more radical claim that a Christian can make in our time, in this age, than that there is a king. And he is to be obeyed, and his name is Jesus Christ. The language of kingship or lordship sounds out of place in a society that came into being through a violent revolution against the tyranny of a king, King George III of England. From our nation's founding, we have not only eschewed monarchs, but even the idea of royalty, of elite classes of persons defined by regal bloodlines. Rather, our nation has often strived for equality, either of opportunity or outcome, depending on the prevailing political philosophy, but we have not had royalty. The truth is there has always been something countercultural to the Christian claim that Jesus is our Lord. And not just our Lord, we believe Lord of heaven and earth. Now we use that expression, Jesus is Lord, so lightly today that it's basically come to mean Jesus is really, really important to me. We forget that when the early Christians made this claim that there was only one Lord, that was punishable by imprisonment and death because there was indeed only one Lord, and that one Lord was Caesar. To acknowledge a rival Lord was to put yourself at odds with the prevailing political arrangement of the day. So on this Sunday that marks the end of our liturgical year, we remember that our holy days are not days commemorating patriotic acts or historical battles or civic virtues, fine as those things are, but that for the Christian, today we celebrate the kingdom of God advancing in the world, not through violence, not through armies, but in the work and person of our self-sacrificing sovereign, who came not to be served, but to serve. Not to kill, but to be killed. This is a king like no other, who conquered death not by outliving it, but by dying it. Our world hears the language of king or lord and thinks of tyranny or oppression or threats to personal freedom. The truth is, though, that to be free, to do whatever the hell we want, is indeed to invite hell. For it's not freedom to be bound to the self's every changing whim or worst impulses. That's not freedom. That is bondage. True freedom comes from being set free from self. And if the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, sets you free, then you are free indeed. Maybe you remember that classic exchange from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, where King Arthur identifies himself to that peasant woman as her king. And she responds, well, I didn't vote for you. Remember King Arthur's response? You don't vote for kings. To turn this around and use scriptural language, we might say, we don't elect our Lord. He elects us. And not just to be his subjects, 
but to be his friends. So in John chapter 15, Jesus tells his followers, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. This little verse in John 15 is the hinge that opens up all our lessons this morning. Because the rule of Christ is not some abstract thing, a God in the heavens pulling levers, pushing buttons, but rather by God's word and sacrament through his people gathered around uh, the altar, through the spirit that calls and enlivens us, God's reign is through his church wherein he empowers you and me to be participants in his rule. By following our Lord's example and laying down our lives in every little act of repentance and forgiveness and mercy and patience in the long suffering endured, in the word of encouragement that we proffer to another, in all these ways, God's reign of peace is quietly manifested in the world. And we know that God's peace is not like the world's peace. In fact, God's peace often incites violent opposition. We worship a crucified king, after all, whose only crown was a crown of thorns. And tradition holds that all the apostles died a martyr's death, all but John. John, who after surviving being boiled alive in a vat of oil, lived out his final days on the island of Patmos. In other words, it was not an easy thing to follow the crucified and risen king of kings. One of the great dangers to the Christian faith is that it becomes domesticated or housebroken. It is he that we bring the faith home. I'm not using domesticated in the sense that we shouldn't be uh, teaching the young. I believe strongly in reviving the idea of the domestic church, that we need to teach our young the scriptures and the creeds and the great hymns of the church around the dinner table, in our homes, too little time uh, spent sharing the gospel with our own families. But by domesticating Christianity, I mean something else. I mean that we turn it into just another organization that we belong to, just another social club that we can take or leave. No, the friends of Christ the King do not take his lordship so lightly. Rather, we recognize that in trials and tribulations, as surely as in times of joyous celebration, we belong to the church of Christ. And the reign of Christ is manifest through the self-giving work of Christ's church, his body on the earth. And if you recall, Christ's body on the earth was not always treated particularly well. To be a part of Christ's body is to be a part of his suffering and wounded body, even as it is also by faith, in hope, to be a part of his transfigured and resurrected and glorified body in heaven. But what does all this have to do with our reading from the prophet Ezekiel or our Lord's parable of the sheep and the goats? From Ezekiel, the temple priest turned prophet, we learn that our king is a good shepherd. The shepherd of Israel who has replaced the shepherds who have come before. The shepherds of Israel in the past have failed her people. Ezekiel uh, speaks often of all the ways that the leadership have failed the people of Israel and left them vulnerable to Babylonian conquest. And now Babylon has laid waste to the city and burned the temple and marched its people in this first wave of captivity out of that holy land. And the prophet Ezekiel is among them in exile, 
who sees the temple burning, all the great prophecies of God's fire coming down and filling the temple with God's presence, but now in this kind of inverted uh, image, this desecrated picture of God's temple being destroyed by earthly fire. What of our king then? What of the good shepherd who is promised to come to the aid of his people? Does he turn his back on them? No. Even as the prophet Ezekiel is being marched away as a captive, he is declaring that God has not abandoned his people, but is in fact going into captivity, following them into exile. And we read, Thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for the sheep. Hear that? Those other shepherds have failed my people. And now God says, I myself will search for the sheep and will seek them out. And Ezekiel's prophecy continues, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost. And I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, but the overfed and the strong, I will destroy them. I will feed them with justice. Who is this shepherding God whom Ezekiel says will seek out the lost and bind up the broken and strengthen the weak? As we approach Advent, isn't this That story, the story of God's people waiting for their Messiah, their divine king to come and set the world right. And wasn't it another king, Herod the Great, who commanded the slaughter of the innocents because he feared a rival king in the helpless baby born in Bethlehem? From Ezekiel, we learn that God is a shepherd who follows after us, goes with us into exile, into captivity, down to death itself for our sake, to make us free from our bondage to sin and selfishness. Ezekiel prophesies the coming reign of Christ, and it is that reign that we witness in the Gospels, like in our reading today from Matthew 25, where our Lord picks up the language of judgment from Ezekiel, separating out the fat sheep who have bullied the flock from the lean ones who have been denied their share. Our Lord comes to set things right, and in his wild, apocalyptic uh, story that he shares here, we may struggle as we hear this language of fire and judgment. When we hear our Lord declare that he will separate out the sheep from the goats with the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left, and to the sheep we hear the shepherd will say, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, but to the goats enter into eternal fire. We could spend weeks and weeks on this rich parable on all the ways that it is inverting and playing with the language of the prophets throughout the Old Testament. This language of eternity is complex language as well. The word eternal doesn't describe a temporal period without end, but rather a moment outside of time. But here it's important, lest we presume too much, to note that this side of eternity. There is goat and sheep in each one of us. And in fact, the vision from Ezekiel that our Lord is recreating in his parable imagines the Son of Man enthroned in his temple and a fire burning, not the fire of Babylonian destruction of the temple, but the fire of God's presence, of God's all-consuming love. In Revelation, a very similar scene is envisioned with God's presence filling the temple, coming to dwell with God's people, and that presence again envisioned as a fire from heaven. Fire which can destroy, but can also give life. Think of a home that's destroyed by fire, or think of 
cold folks out in the woods huddled around a warm fire. Fire is dangerous, but it has the capacity to impart life as well as to take it. And yet the fire that our Lord is speaking about is not earthly fire. Recall Moses and the burning bush, that divine fire that burns yet does not consume the tree. So Zechariah, Malachi, Jeremiah, and a host of other prophets throughout the Old Testament will speak of God's fire as a refiner's fire. A fire which refines us, that is, it makes us to be what we truly are. And that's the background image for our Lord's parable of judgment, where God's judgment is viewed as an unmasking, a burning away, a revealing of the truth about our lives. And the truth at the center of this parable is that there are not two fires burning in the temple, but one. And as a colleague has reminded me just this week, in the Jewish sacrificial system, goats were for sin offerings and sheep for burnt offerings, but both entered the same fire in the Jerusalem temple. So too, none of us will escape the fire of God's love. The question is, How will we experience God's love? Will we experience that fire as purgative, as restorative, as refining us and fitting us for the kingdom that has been prepared for us? Or will we find ourselves curved in on ourselves, resisting God's love, clinging to love of self and love of sin, telling ourselves that Freedom doesn't mean being liberated from the tyranny of self and selfish choices, but that it means our freedom to choose whatever hell we want, whatever the hell we want. On Christ the King Sunday, we are reminded that to belong to the kingdom of God here and now means recognizing not that God is a threat to our freedom, but that he is the condition for our being free at all. We remember, too, that to be in the kingdom of God means to stand up against the gates of hell. That means reminding one another and the world that God has come looking for us, that he desires us to join him in kingdom work here and now, which looks like welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, caring for the sick, and visiting the incarcerated. Why does our Lord love us so much? Well, that is one of the great mysteries, something that we may not fully understand this side of the kingdom. But he loves us so much that he leaves heaven to come down and to seek and to save the lost. And insofar as we love those he loves and serve those whom he came to serve, then we serve and love our King. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Longing for Christ's reign to come among us, we pray for the outpouring of God's power on the church, the world, and all in need, 
responding to hear us, O God, with your mercy is great. Lord of all, train our ears to hear your cry in the needs of those around us. Bless all social ministries of the church through which we seek to serve others as we ourselves have been served. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You cause rain to fall on the just and the unjust alike. Direct our use of creation to provide for the needs of all people in ways that are sustainable for our earth. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Bring peace to every place where conflict rages, in nations, among nations, within families, and in human hearts. Grant opportunities for ending divisions among us, and usher in your reign of unity and and reconciliation for your world. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord, we ask that you would tear down the walls that we erect between us, and release us from prejudice, that we might come to see you in the face of the stranger as well as the friend. Restore our capacity to see your image in those whose dignity we have stripped away. Help us to see our very existence as a good gift. Help us to know that it is good that we exist, that we are made in your image and for your glory, and help us extend our dignity to others, that we might guard and protect and honor them in ways that honor you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Pour out the gifts of your Holy Spirit on the children of this congregation. Bless our school, our teachers, our staff, and our students. Keep them healthy and safe, we pray. Be with parents in our congregation and our school. During this time of schooling and working from home, sustain them in their difficult tasks. Give them joy in the midst of hardship. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Thank you, O Lord, for saints now departed who fed the hungry, clothed the naked, and tended the sick. Inspire us by their example that we may see your presence in those in need around us. We especially give thanks for all who work in healthcare services this season of pandemic, for those serving at Josephine Caring Community and Bethany, Providence Hospital and Marysville Care Center. Lord, we pray that the recent COVID outbreaks there might be contained. Keep staff and residents safe, we pray, and comfort those who are grieving deaths this season, especially those loved ones of the 250,000 that we have lost to coronavirus in our nation alone. Heal our nation and the nations of the world. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, until that day when you gather all of creation around your throne, where you will reign forever and ever. Amen.
And now may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine on you, be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve your King. Thanks be to God.